So thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm privileged to host you. And, and it's wonderful to see students in the Zuckerman Museum of Art. You know, the ZMA is your space. It's your performative space. The music facility has uh, the performance hall. Dance has the dance theater. There's Stillwell Theater for the theater folks. This is your room and, and it should be a part of your excursion occasionally when you have agency to visit or, or to look at work. It's about you and trying to inform you. And so we're trying to create an opportunity for an exhibit that uh, was going to fill a little bit of dead time because we are going to have an amazing Leslie Dill exhibit in March and uh, it's going to be extraordinary. But we didn't want the galleries closed from January through. And so uh, I propose that we do a printmaking exhibition because we have an exceptional collection of works on paper. And we are the home for the Southern Graphics Council archives. And the SGCI is the largest printmaking consortium in the world. And, uh, and we grow that collection annually because it's generally professional printmakers, um, some students, professors who are contributing to the ecology of visual development. And what I love particularly about printmaking is when I went to graduate school, I knew how to draw and paint. I had been an illustrator for a very long time. What I wasn't so familiar with was the broad diversity of mark making and image development that can be uh, generated through printmaking. Highly complex, sometimes very immediate, uh, sometimes almost always a predicament in terms of visual problem solving. And I love that idea of working myself around a problem. And so I practice printmaking. I have gratuitously thrown in a couple of my pieces in this show. So self-indulgent, very much a self-indulgent exercise. But what I wanted to do was start off with two pieces that really reflect the past and the present. The past, a 14th century, a beautiful Albrecht Durer woodcut. And Albrecht Durer is the, the great, great, great grandfather of printmaking. Worked on wooden surfaces, um, engraved those surfaces, always with the AD, his signature at the bottom of the page. It's remarkable that we have one in such mint condition here. It's a terrific piece. And then we move to more of the color field artists and the, um, uh, the generation of what might be considered modernity and contemporary art with Joseph Albers. And if you are anyone who studies color theory, you will have seen these squares within a square within a square. And this is an absolutely mint example of a Joseph Albers gray study. And, uh, the capacity to get the tonality of a medium gray, a dark gray, and a black, and have it resonate in the same way that his paintings does is really exceptional. So the past and the present welcoming you into the gallery and, and a wide range of printmaking to follow. What's really fantastic about the collection of the Zuckerman Museum of Art is that we've been blessed to have some works of really historical significance. Um, and when I started this exhibition, the idea of curating this exhibition, I wanted to bring a very broad brushed approach to the historical context of what we own and have it merge into the more contemporary art with which we have a more robust collection. So I'm starting here with uh, one of the pieces of the bullfighting series that was, uh, was of Goya. And Goya had two series with which he was most familiar. It was the bullfighting series and the disaster of wars series. Unfortunately, we don't have one of the pieces of the disasters of war, but we have an incredible piece from the bullfighting series. Both the disasters of war and the bullfighting series from Goya were very concerned with the human condition, uh, life and death, how we have a time on this earth uh, 
and what do we do with it and how we engage with it. Conceptual development was not fully a practice at those times. It was more about seeing and writing and drawing and printing what you knew and what you observed. But nonetheless, the importance of that concept of life and death in relationship to humanity is what Goya was approaching in both his Disaster of War series and his Bullfighting series. Here we have a really lovely etching from James Whistler. And Whistler uh, was known as a painter, but he was also a really brilliant printmaker, very delicate printmaking. It was a way to get work in front of an audience more broadly than an individual painting. That's one of the exciting things about printmaking is that it's done in multiples. It's meant for human consumption. It's meant for a more pluralistic audience to see. It's a very democratic art process in that way. And Whistler was very good with the etched line. Uh, very delicate etchings that showed the areas in which he lived, in which he experienced. And so you'll see a lot of scenes of the countryside of England or of the docks of, of England and where he worked and, and spent time. And it gives us a sense of time and place in a very intimate scale. The French Impressionists loved printmaking. They were influenced primarily by Japanese prints, um, of which there is a piece in this exhibit. Uh, very impressed by the Japanese woodblock prints. They were also very impressed uh, with African masks and African narratives and storytelling. And the Impressionists tried to change the language of art from what was replicated time and again in, in the very haughty salons of Paris to something that was more about the observance of light, color, and the immediacy of time um, in, the, in the environment that they occupied. This is a work by Child Hassan. It's a very delicate lithograph, a simple lithograph of uh, the environment that surrounded him. And this is Auguste Renoir, so an impressionist here, and moving slightly from Impressionism to post-Impressionism, careful, and a very delicate study of a nude here. And this is where printmaking really became a dynamic political exercise. And this is in the 1930s in German. So the German post-Expressionist artists. This is Lionel Fenninger, who um, also, was a very well-known comic strip artist. But he was also known in fine art circles as somebody who was a German expressionist. And German expressionism was loathed by Berlin. Berlin, the government of Berlin hated it because the artists were reflecting the, uh, the greed of the German government, those that had wealth and used it and those who did not. And uh, this disjointed government situation that created uh, instability among uh, the, the common masses. And uh, what happened with the German expressionists was they would create lots and lots and lots of prints. And those prints were essentially wheat pasted across Berlin and other cities where audiences would look at the work, relate to the work, and, and form their impressions of, of their relationship to their common citizens and to the government. And we really get to that with George Gross. And George Gross really took on the Weimar Republic um, and the post-World War I into the World War II era of Germany when Germany was recovering from World War I had a great deal of resentment about uh, the, the kinds of pacts and agreements and treaties that had been signed that essentially held them in check and would not allow them 
to grow, and that eventually spawned the development of Nazism. And so the artists of that time, between the 19-teens and the 1940s, really were resistant to government, fought against uh, corruption and greed, and that fomented a lot of discussion. Here we see Kenneth Miller. This is from approximately 1929. Uh, this is uh, Two Women Shopping. I really love this piece, although this is not part of that expressionist movement in the same kind of way. It reflects um, Art Deco and uh, American um, wealth right before the crash of the stock market. And so you have women shopping and, and women living in a very affluent time, uh, women really asserting their, their privilege and, and their place in society when historically that had been repressed. And this becomes a really lovely reflection of that. This is a wonderful little lith lithograph by Thomas Hart Benton. Th Thomas Hart Benton became known as one of the regionalists and uh, uh, worked with the, um, the federal government for the federal works program, which happened during the depression where the government would put artists to work. They would do posters, they would do murals in government buildings. And Thomas Hart Benton became known as one of the regionalists along with Grant Wood and uh, Curry and some of the other folks who were working at that time. Thomas Hart Benton lived in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, he went to the Kansas City Art Institute. He was uh, the teacher of Pollock, Jackson Pollock, although Pollock didn't work representationally when he first started out. He was working representationally before he went into his drips and splatters and changed the, the language of art. But Thomas Hart Benton was his uh, teacher and uh, was a longtime professor at, at the Art Institute. And I love this piece. I love the chiaroscuro, the black and white relationships. Thomas Hart Benton's house, I've shared this with my colleagues who work in the ZMA. I lived in Kansas City for 14 years and his house was right next to my house. And so I had this wonderful little 1920s bungalow and his house was this big old stone thing. Um, but I had a big old carved uh, American gold, no, bald eagle totem pole in my front yard because the person who had owned the house previously to my wife and me uh, was a Vietnam vet and he wanted to honor um, honor his service. And so we had this giant totem pole when we moved in and Carolyn, my wife said, oh, this is so ugly, we gotta take it down. I said, no, this is so ugly, we absolutely need to keep it. <laughs> and so we'd get, we were on the tourist map in, in Kansas City and people would come over and uh, go on tour the Thomas Hart Benton Museum, which was his house next door to us. And then they'd come over and take photographs in front of our, our home with the eagle. So I have a fondness in my heart for, for Benton. How is that for just bloviating? Carl Eppel, uh, not so representational, but I really, really like the energy of this, of this print. What I particularly love about printmaking is there are so many ways to construct an image. So many ways, so many methodologies. And, uh, and I think it's essential. So when we were creating curriculum for comics, and illustration, we required printmaking as part of that curriculum because making images in prints is not simple and developing an image takes time, patience, a willingness to learn process, a willingness to fail, a willingness to find a way through that failure to making something work. Why did it come off the press looking great one time with your Alquotent and the next time it looks horrid, and finding a way to solve those problems and make it 
come together. Well, the same sort of intellectual discipline and energy is required for making comics and illustration. You need to learn a variety of ways to compose images, a variety of tools, not just colored pencils, not just markers, not just iPad and Procreate. You need to understand the process of making work and building an image and building a composition and understanding the entirety of the process. And that is particularly what I love about, about printmaking. We have a couple of really wonderful examples of Chagall here. And Chagall uh, worked through the 1940s post-war particularly into the, the 1960s and 70s. And as an older man, he was actually uh, the next door neighbor of Bill Wyman, the longtime bassist for the Rolling Stones. And um, they became best friends. And there were a number of books on photography that Bill Wyman created on, on Mark Chagall. And they are an essential part of a collector's, uh, a book collector's a library of your you're looking at Chagall pieces. Uh, lots of dream sequences. Chagall was um, Russian originally, emigrated to, to France, was Jewish, and, uh, and a lot of his work was based on his, his sense of dislocation in a new community, a new environment, and also uh, the, the fables and, and the stories that were in in the Bible, and he would merge dream-like sequences, uh, the sequences of migration, the sequences of, of uh, religion, and Jewish narrative and storytelling into his prints. And while they tend to be very serious at the same time, they express a very playful side to his personality, and these are really lovely. Printmaking, we'll talk a little bit about this, is a relatively new art form in the United States, whereas it goes back to the 13th and 14th century in, in Europe. But in the United States, it didn't really exist until right after World War II. And we'll get into that just a little bit as we go into the next section. But I wanted to uh, share with you this wonderful Wolverine from John James Audubon, and uh, a wonderful lithograph. Lithograph is, lithography is the most complex and frustrating and rewarding art form discipline within the genre of printmaking because um, it's where everything can go wrong. Absolutely everything can go wrong because you're drawing on a stone and uh, the concept of lithography is uh, grease is going to accept ink, but it's going to reject water. And, and the stone, um, you draw on a stone with a grease pencil. But when you are etching that stone, what you have to do is you use a little bit of gum arabic and a little bit of nitric acid. And you have to look at the density and richness of the blacks and then the, uh, the ranges of grays to a light, and that determines how many drops of acid you're going to put into that gum arabic solution, and then you have to paint it on. And the idea of dabbing it on and making sure that it stays wet and moist as you are moving it around the, the stone, um, determines the density of the blacks and whites. And then what happens is you take lithotine, which is essentially a, um, a solvent like mineral spirits, and you remove the entirety of that drawing. Um, and it completely disappears. And the faith that you have and how that image is going to come out is based on, did you etch this thing right? and you've spent hours and hours and hours building this drawing on this stone, and it could wash out and not come back or not come back appropriately. So you wipe it down with lithotine, and then you roll it back up with a greasy ink, and the image 
returns and comes back. And that's what you print it from. There are a lot of iterations and generations in between. But it's the one art form where everything you put down is gone for that moment of time. And, and the faith in your skills determines whether or not that image comes back. And yet you are rewarded if you've done your job well with the most rich, vibrant, and layered uh, imagery because you can add multiple colors, not essentially on the same stone. You can add different stones or you can um, augment the stone with aluminum ball grain plates, which is probably what a lot of you are using for lithography here. Um, and you can add capacity to the prints, but it's a really wonderful form. So a beautiful Audubon lithograph and then an Athos Menaboni lithograph. Menaboni was a very popular artist who worked in the second half of the, the 20th century, did a lot of animal prints, um, bird prints, uh, flowers, a lot of greeting cards. He was uh, uh, the favorite artist of the owner of Coca-Cola, the Woodruffs, and Bob Woodruff, who um, owned Coca-Cola, was chairman of the board for many years, and for whom the Woodruff Art Center and the High Museum are named downtown. And so uh, we have, I think we have the largest collection of Menabonis in, in the world. And, um, and we have a wonderful donor, Russ Clayton, who has given those to us, and he's very passionate about these. They're very delicate, they're really beautiful, um, and I thought that having this conversation between an Audubon and a Menaboni was a good conversation to have because they're parallel in terms of the discipline, animal prints, and then I thought I'd throw in the brilliant Oscar Gillespie. And Oscar Gillespie is the head of the printmaking department in the graduate program at Bradley University in Peoria, Illinois, and he's best known as an engraver. So he will take a burin, a very sharp metal instrument, and engrave directly into the, uh, the copper plate. For the most part, it's copper. It can be zinc, um, sometimes steel, and create this wonderful line. So this is a hybrid sort of bird, antelope, buffalo, bison kind of print, uh, and extremely delicate. So this is engraving a color mesotint. Uh, if any of you has done a mesotint, that's um, using a rocker. On, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that a little later on when we go see Art Werger in the next room. Love this piece, very layered, silk screen piece. William Villalongo, who is a young contemporary African-American artist and printmaker who is really finding his, uh, his way now and becoming very popular in New York. I think that this piece is extraordinarily dynamic. And when it was presented to us as a possibility for our collection, I said, yes, please, <laughs> because I love the energy here. It's it sort of reminds me of pop art, uh, and um, and things tend to go around, you know, come around and go around and and become relevant again. And the dynamism of this, and uh, I'm also a huge fan of the movie The Beatles, Yellow Submarine, and I think that the way he's used the hands here and highlighted the fingernails reminds me of that the blue meanies and the gloves that fly around. If you've ever seen uh, that very pop artish um, movie, it's, it's a lot of fun. And so uh, this piece just really speaks to me. And another artist that we've recently acquired, William Steiger, he shows at a gallery in town. I love this because of the placement just the negative space relationship. It's very simple. Um, it just works for me. I paired these two pieces together. This is not part of the Southern Graphics Council, but this uh, is a very famous uh, Japanese 
woodblock artist Toshi Yoshida. I love the woodcut artists from Japan, um, particularly the late 19th and early 20th century woodcut, woodcut artists. It tended to be um, a very family thing. The, the printers were families that went for generation and generation. Um, grandfather, father, and son would often work uh, in, in the studios to create the blocks. But what I really love about them is the saturation color and the, the sensitivity of, of the rendering. And because I'm a huge fan of comic books and comic strips, I think that the Japanese woodcut artists have a very similar kind of um, approach to storytelling and environment and the color palette tends to look to me like the really wonderful 1960s, 50s, when artists would create pen and ink, and then somebody would color those with Dr. Martin dyes or watercolors, and then they were printed on really cheap newsprint. And the sort of amber, yellowish, off-white color of the newsprint would suck up that ink and would give you a very sensitive and saturated palette that to me reminds me of this. Uh, today's comics are much more slick paper and Photoshop colors and don't have that same kind of sensitivity. But these are generally built on several blocks. There might be five blocks in here and each layer would cover a certain kind of color and uh, the ink is brushed on. It's essentially a watercolor and it's brushed on. And then um, each block has little divots that are cut into it so that we know that the print is going to hinge and fall correctly every single time. And, uh, and they use a burnisher and burnish that on there. And, um, and each layer is gently applied and built. It's a, it's a lost art form. There are only a few people who do this anymore. Um, but to me, it's, it's as calming and meditative as any printmaking art form that I've seen. And some of the contemporary artists are changing up because they're, rather than being contemplative, they're very direct and, and aggressive. But I wanted to um, contrast this with another kind of environmental piece that's done by Sean Caulfield. And Sean Caulfield primarily works in woodcut and liner cut and usually in very large pieces. Now, this is a, a, is it a liner cut or a woodcut? It's a, so it's a relief. So it could be a, a either a woodcut or, or a liner cut, but it has digital printing on it as well. Uh, Sean runs the printmaking program at the University of Alberta and uh, he is really known for these dynamic and expressive kinds of pieces, moody. Everything is very, very moody and, and dramatic. Um, so they have a little bit of a dystopian feel to them, but at the same time, I find them very jolly. And, and, and uh, you know, even though there's something eerie going here, this smoke that emanates from the second story of this whether it's a wood-framed cabin or with a tent top, can't really tell, but that smoke circulates around and comes back around down here is something that looks like this blob of oil or, or something like that that's become almost alive. It has an energy to it. And what is this thing that's growing out of the side of this cabin? love the mystery of it. It's, it's really terrific. Todd Walker. Um, Todd Walker is primarily known as a photographer. He led the photography program for many, many, many years. One of the best known photographers in the United States. Um, he led the program at the University of Florida and University of Florida brought in another photographer. If any of you is a photographer, you might know the name Jerry Yulesman. Jerry Yulesman um, at one time was uh, one of the best conceptual photographers working in the world. And he would use up to 15 enlargers simultaneously to build 
his photographic prints and sandwich negatives. All that led to um, a dynamic relationship with, with printmaking. And, and Todd Walker took his photographs and developed um, a printmaking discipline as well, which I think is very, very exciting. And uh, so this is a screen print, but it's a very sophisticated screen print with a really wonderful dot pattern. And so with screen printing, if you are working from a photograph, if you don't have a dot matrix, if you don't have a dot pattern, uh, what ends up happening is you just get a blob of ink. So screen printing uh, particularly needs to have a dot pattern in which to hold the ink. And so if you're working with a photograph and you um, are a color photograph and you want to replicate that as a screen print, what you're going to have to do is take that photograph into Photoshop and you're going to have to break it down into either CYMK or RGB and you're going to have to print out separations and expose um, screens to get those particular separations because that will hold the dot pattern. You have to bitmap the um, the photo separations so that you have a dot pattern and you can get as many DPI as you wish or as few DPI as you wish, uh, but it needs to have something to hold that, uh, that process. I like this uh, collection of four. So this is Red Grooms who is very well known as a, um, a pop artist and pop post-pop artist. His work is always playful and uh, we're lucky to have it. Red Grooms is, is just somebody, whenever I look at a piece of his, I know that he's having fun with it. Um, this is Yuji Hiratsuka, who creates very delicate um, etchings and shinkale pieces. Uh, he teaches at Oregon State University. Shinkale is when you have a matrix, generally in etching, and then you apply um, to the plate a, uh, a lightly glued surface of translucent paper, which is going to be lighter than the, the paper on which it's printed so that you can ensure that it's gonna hold. And then you run that shinkale through the press. And what happens with etching is that the print is not on the surface, the print is in the surface. Because when you're working with etching, you soak your paper, cotton fiber paper, it opens up the grain and fibers of that paper. And what happens is when you roll it through a press, you've got 3,500 pounds per square inch pressure. And that ink is going into that damp paper and it's going in between the grains and fibers of that paper, commensurate with the, the shinkale, that piece of paper. And then that paper dries and the fibers contract and that ink and that paper is one piece of artwork. And so it absorbs into it. Whereas silk screen is on top and lithography is on top and woodcuts are on top. So, this is Matthew Egan. I love his work. It reminds me of um, a very cacophonous comic strip panel. Uh, lots of energy and conversation going on. Very detailed, very delicate, very intimate in scale. Uh, he teaches at Eastern Carolina University in, in Greenville, North Carolina. And this is our very own Cynthia Lawless who if ever, any of you have had her as a professor, she uh, is one of the nicest people ever put on this planet. And is also a complete and total rock star. Everybody in the printmaking community around the world knows who Cynthia Lawless is. And she's an expert in, in book arts. So I thought that these had a nice sort of relationship in terms of scale, color and pattern with each other. So the idea about curating is that the pieces are in conversation um, and that they're sending out these energies to you that um, you respond to and, and create the feedback to secure the performance. This is a really wonderful piece by Mel Ramos. And Mel Ramos was uh, particularly known as a, a pop artist 
working in a popular genre. This sort of references, if you know Manet's Olympia and uh, the great concept of the gaze, or the male gaze on the female form. He's just taking this up a notch and putting it into contemporary 1960s, 1970, I think it's from the 1974, um, into our modern ecology. In the 1970s and 80s, there was a movement that absolutely rejected abstract expressionism, uh, which was so popular in, in contemporary art, abstract expressionism, color field paintings of the 1950s and early 60s. And the pop artists responded to that by absolutely saturating audiences with um, art that was based on very popular culture cheap advertising, um, comic books, uh, what you would see on billboards. Um, it was responding to the human condition of the 1960s. Uh, a movement called realism, super realism, and we have that with John Bader, who was born in 1938, and I love this market diner. If any of you, I'm a New Yorker, I grew up in New York City and, um, and lived probably close to 20 years in Manhattan. At one time, this sort of environment was pretty ubiquitous. You could see a diner every four blocks or so. And they would be contrasted against these apartment complexes. And so this just reflects to me a time and place uh, in, our, in our history but it's got a very dynamic lateral composition, but it's also full of movement. So you've got these diagonals that move you into the picture plane, but you've got these horizontals that move you across, but this diagonal goes to this vertical, which is repeated in these vertical elements that are in the uh, that they are in the apartment complex and the division spaces between the buildings so something that looks very stagnant and straightforward has multivalent capacity in terms of its compositional relationship to the audience john hitchcock screen print john hitchcock um, is a, an artist who works at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, which has an incredible um, history to it in terms of printmaking. And uh, he, he's of Native American descent, so a lot of his work has to do with uh, the Midwest, um, Native American iconography and culture, and his relationship to the environment. And um, his work is just dynamic. I love him, I love the guy, he's fun, um, and, and his work has a real vitality to it. This is one of mine, super gratuitous, self-indulgent print called Little Red Riding Hood. Um, this is etching, aquatint, uh, this took me about three months to do. So I, as an illustrator, I had assignments for magazines and newspapers that were overnight. And, uh, and I get used to working very, very quickly. Doing a plate this size is not quick. Um, and uh, it takes a lot of concentration and a lot of scraping and burnishing and, and adding layers of aquatint. So um, it's a very creative title called Little Red Riding Hood. I really worked on that one. But it's, it's creating these uh, juxtapositional relationships because Little Red Riding Hood here is, is this is based on a cartoon called Little Red that was um, done by, I think, Warner Brothers. I think it was a Warner Brothers cartoon um, back in the 1940s where Little Red was not such an innocent person. Uh, she was um, more self-aware, self-confident. And, um, and so Little Red Riding Hood here is somebody who's in her 20s, early 20s perhaps. The wolf is a very lecherous kind of thing. And there's other iconography here. So we have this swirling little creek with a, a fish in it. Um, 
fish you can see is jumping into this uh, box, which would have been, you know, for a for a picnic or something. There's stuff coming out of that box. Um, so I've imbued it with layers of sort of suggestive imagery um, to, uh, to just add to the context. If you know these shoes, little girls used to wear them. They were called Mary Janes. Um, so I threw those in there. Um, Valerie Dibble. Uh, Valerie was very instrumental in getting the Southern Graphics Council uh, archives here to the Zuckerman Museum. So let me talk just a little bit about um, contemporary printmaking in the United States. As I mentioned earlier in the other room, it didn't exist. There, there was no printmaking that was being taught at universities until around World War II and just after World War II. And what happened was, in Europe, there was a significant tradition of printmaking. But uh, they were part of uh, primarily, a lot of them were oppressed. Many of them were Jewish. And with the rise of Nazism and the progression of a Nazi Germany into the culture of other environments where they were occupying territory, um, printmakers were considered degenerate artists. And they were threatened. And if they were Jewish, they were really threatened. And so what happened was they fled. And many of them emigrated to the United States. And it wasn't until the early 1940s that we had a printmaker named Mauricio Lozanski, who was of Jewish German descent, um, Italian, some Italian there as well. And he emigrated to the US and settled in Iowa City, Iowa, where the University of Iowa is, one of the best universities in the country and a really good art program. And Lozanski brought his printmaking skills with him. And in the 40s and 50s, it wasn't until late 50s and early 60s that you would find printmaking actually back in art departments and universities and colleges. They were in places like home economics where women would go and make little crafts and, uh, and in the early parts of, um, of the 20th century, or they were in um, primarily teachers' schools. Like uh, an example of a teacher's university would be um, what we know now as James Madison uh, University in Virginia or Jacksonville State University in Alabama. These were primarily teaching schools. And their audience at, uh, in the early part of the um, 20th century, they were named, they were different names. Um, but they were primarily women who were getting uh, an education to help become educators in the workforce. And printmaking, little presses and things like that were, were shunted aside and put over there. And that's where printmaking had been residing. It wasn't until Lazansky came in and uh, started a printmaking program at the University of Iowa that other emig emigrants from Germany to the United States or other European countries came in and established printmaking programs at colleges, particularly in the Big Ten colleges. You know, Iowa, Michigan, Indiana, Ohio State, uh, those schools that brought printmaking back. And uh, professors in our community thought, well, this is about image development. This has some complexity to it, and it has some usefulness in the ecology of art schools. Uh, but it did not become a popular medium with contemporary artists until Tatiana Grossman in New York formed United Limited Art Editions. So Tatiana Grossman was another German, Russian immigrant. And she moved to Islip, Long Island. And when she bought a house, she was an artist, a bookmaker, book arts maker. And when she moved to Long Island um, and bought the house, in her backyard, she found several litho stones that had been disposed of and, and used as um, you know, walking pavement to leading up to the back door of her house. They excavated these stones, they were huge. And she was trying to create um, 
an artist community. And what she ended up doing was, okay, found these stones. She knew what they were about. Um, brought them into her house, into her garage, and created a studio. And actually, her next door neighbor was trying to get rid of a lithography press. Just had one. And she brought that in to her place, and she created essentially a new wave of printmaking in the United States because she brought in Larry Rivers, Jasper Johns, and Robert Rauschenberg, and asked them, do you want to play with this brand new art form that you haven't been thinking about, printmaking? And it wasn't until Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg and Larry Rivers, who was a little less known, but one of my favorite artists, started going out to Long Island and making prints and experimenting with an art form that they had no clue about, that it became acceptable and part of the ecology of contemporary American printmaking uh, to be a part of the discussion in galleries and museums. They started it. And I think that that, to me, is really fascinating. And so you had other folks that jumped on the bandwagon, folks like Andy Warhol, who really popularized printmaking, and then um, James Rosenquist and, and others. No. including Red Grooms, who was another one of those artists who went out to Islip and worked and started making prints. And so that became something entirely new and, and then the universities were picking up on things and suddenly printmaking started moving into college environments across the United States and becoming a part of the curriculum. So that's, that's your little short history. Dennis O'Neill, one of the great printmakers and collectors and protagonists of, of printmaking um, in America as well. A lovely example. This is Ken Kerslick. Ken Kerslick was my professor in undergraduate school at the University of Florida. And he was an expert in taking what had been done by guys like John Walker over there and converting um, photo mechanical reproduction into contemporary printmaking. This work might look a little bit dated now, but in the mid 1970s when this had never been done before and the photo mechanical process for contemporary printmaking and art making was not part of the conversation. And he developed it and became a star. The nicest, most gentle and kind man and gracious man I've ever had the opportunity to work with. Um, passed away several years ago. I actually curated an exhibition of his down at uh, the Vero Beach Art Museum in Vero Beach, Florida, and um, a lovely guy. This is Art Werger, and Art Werger uh, recently retired from Ohio University, but he worked uh, for many, many years at a women's university college in, in central Georgia. I forget the name of it, pardon me. Um, do you know the name? Wesleyan, thank you. Was at Wesleyan for years and years and years, and then eventually went, into, uh, went to Ohio University. Art Werger will work in um, etching, multiple plate etching. Uh, this is an etching, but he also works principally in mesotint, and we talked about mesotint before. Mesotint is where you take a copper plate and you use a rocker, which um, looks like a little shovel with a handle, and it rocks back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and you go horizontally, vertical, and diagonally all across that plate, and what you're doing is that that rocker has many, 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 many tiny little teeth on it. And what it's doing on the copper plate is raising the burr uh, so that it's creating a tooth. And that copper plate, if you inked it up and rolled it under the press, would be pitch black. And, and then he would take a scraper like you use for your, your etchings, and he would scrape off very lightly areas, sometimes to the point of back to the plate where he burnishes it to pure white, but he would create a whole image just on grayscale, black to gray, by removing the surface, uh, by scraping down those burrs and creating less, um, 
less volume within the plate to hold ink. Uh, a master and a really great guy. This is William Walmsley, um, and William Walmsley led the printmaking program at Florida State University for many, many years. He was a friend of mine. He was, uh, you can see it on this plate. Um, William Walm Walmsley had uh, another name that he was called frequently in the printmaking community, and that was Ding Dong Daddy. And, um, and he would work with, he would make prints of popsicle sticks and maps and things like this. Um, this is actually black light ink. And so you could saturate this under light. And if we had a black light on this, it would glow. Um, his work was very simple, straightforward, playful, and fun. I loved, I loved him. He was a really good guy, even though he was my arch rival because I was a Florida Gator and he was a Seminole. But he was a nice fella. He really wanted me to go to graduate school there. I went, <laughs> no self-respecting gator is going to go to be a seminal. Althea Murphy Price, a beautiful lithograph. Look at the delicate lines on this. So beautiful and delicate. This is Boyd Saunders. Boyd Saunders uh, was a professor for years and years and years at the University of South Carolina. And he was the founder of the Southern Graphics Council International. So Boyd was a, um, a terrific man, a great Southern gentleman. A lot of the work that he did referenced uh, the environments around Columbia, South Carolina. I love this. It's got great energy to it. This too is a lithograph. That fuzziness that he has there, um, not easy to achieve with a lithographic pencil. And see, probably was splattering a little bits of asphaltum onto it to create the texture and the dot pattern. I don't know, but this is several plates. I love the, uh, the gray paper here. It really um, cools the colors a little bit. Uh, very nice. Randy Bolton. Uh, Randy uh, has been at many universities over the years. And what I love about him is he takes popular culture, lots of things about children's books and, and mythology, and creates these sort of playful, although a little bit disturbing images at the same time. Um, they're wonderful. This is a silk screen. Tanya Softich. Um, Beautiful etching and aquatint. Any of you who has tried to do aquatint understands that that is a pretty unforgiving medium. Uh, her work tends to uh, reference plants and cellular structures. Uh, it's, they're very delicate. She's a, she's a master printer. She teaches at the University of Richmond. And this is our very own director of curatorial affairs, Cynthia Norse Thompson who is uh, an extraordinary artist in her own right, as well as a, um, an incredible book artist and a great curator, uh, a, lovely, a lovely piece of hers. This is my dear friend, um, Sid Cross. Sidney Cross was a longtime professor at Clemson University. Um, my story was I had quit illustration and I bought property in the North Georgia mountains and I built a home. And as soon as I did that, I was bored and thought I needed to do something else. And um, so I applied to graduate school thinking I wanted to do something different. And where I was living in North Georgia, there were two schools that had MFAs that were close. One was Clemson and one was the University of Georgia. I was accepted to both. Um, on probation because my undergraduate GPA was a stellar 2.37 because I had uh, I was more interested in other things rather than college uh, when I was in college. Um, and so they weren't convinced that I could do it, but it was because I had a long professional career after graduating from college. But I chose um, Clemson because of Sid and the fact that she asked me, well, what, you've had a really strong career. Why do you want to go back to school? And I said, well, I know how to paint, and I know how to draw, and I think that my conceptual thinking skills are very well developed. I don't understand 
how to do printmaking. I took printmaking in college. I took two levels of printmaking in undergraduate school. But I want new problems to solve for myself and, and to understand the complexity. Sid Cross is a master of lithography and aquatint and um, what a uh, technique which is called acid tinting, which is a very delicate and precise procedure in which you um, saturate areas of a plate with a certain amount of nitric acid and um, and and um, gum arabic, and you can stain you can stain the stone or stain the plate, and it creates these wonderful little tonality structures that are embedded, imbued in this print and create the layers of, of visual information. So this is probably three or four plates, um, three or four stones, maybe a keystone and two or three plates, but she taught me how to do this and, and it changed my life. And um, because of my professional experience, I was put to, to teaching right away while I was still in, in graduate school. So I was a, um, a professor of record for um, you know, some graphic design courses and things. But that gave me some experience in the classroom and, and made me think that maybe academia was a way to go and, and change my career. And uh, so she's very influential in that. So for a long time, she was at um, Clemson, she's retired now, but teaches part-time at um, the University, Cal State Northridge, Northridge, California. This is extraordinary, isn't it? This is, I've seen some of you looking at this. This is Sean Bitters. Um, Sean Bitters is a professor at the University of Kansas in Lawrence, which has a really great printmaking tradition. And Sean is working uh, with these very sophisticated screen prints, where he's taken historic kinds of landscape imagery uh, that reference uh, the late 1860s, 70s, 80s in America. Um, who knows, this could be Lewis and Clark for all we know. And he takes these environments and then he creates these silk screen uh, layer, layering situations. So she, he creates this very intricate, detailed, piece and then adds these silk screen elements on top of them and uh, creates this very strong juxtaposition of um, vibrancy, uh, an, an entirely new kind of narrative and contrasts it with art historical references to, to make these, these pieces. A lovely guy too, by the way. Another buddy of mine is Michael Krieger, and Michael Krieger uh, led the printmaking program at the University of Kansas for many years. He teaches primarily drawing and painting now. While this looks like a very simple drawing, and it's a lithograph, but this guy is the most amazing draftsman I've ever seen. Um, and idea generator that I've ever run across. He is endlessly inventive. And while this looks cartoony and simple, this guy can draw. And, and the drawing will never be hyper-realistic, but it will be always about transcend, transcending drawing to the point that we know that he's enjoying drawing. Does that make sense? That the audience looks at this and looks at this like, man, it looks like he's having fun doing this. And the truth is he's having fun doing this. If you can generate to your audience an idea that this is a lot of fun and I'm having a blast doing it, and you think that that's the way it looks too, that's a, le a level of conversation that is really, really sophisticated. And I would encourage you to be able to imbue your art with, with that because it's an essential part of the performance and of reaching an audience that, you know, a drawing, a painting, a print, a comic book, a illustration is sending out certain kinds of information that the artist has put in there. And I talk about this a lot and uh, in my classes and that 
we as receivers of this artwork bring to the looking of that artwork our own baggage of experiences and likes and dislikes and respond to that. And our response to the drawing completes the circuit of energy that is being sent out and you responding to it. And the art exists as a performance. And, uh, and it requires a receiver to respond to it in a certain kind of way to validate the art. Um, conversely, another artist whom I really like is Fred Stonehouse. And Fred um, is a printmaker at uh, the University of Wisconsin in, in Madison, another, again, great tradition of art making there. And, and Fred's work is very simple, straightforward, a little bit weird. Uh, it just has this contextualization here. And the silent crime, what does that mean? Uh, but th this sort of hood that he's wearing with the cutouts, or are those clouds, what are they? You know, it's a very interesting kind of arrangement. Uh, and I think his work always has energy and vitality to it. Very simple. I love the black and white relation. On this wall, these are all relief prints. And so relief can either be woodblock or lino cut, um, any kind of uh, Cintrix, any kind of surface that is being carved away or removed from the two dimensional plane and um, leaves a gap for a white line to, to fall. And uh, so that's, that's a relief print. This is Suko. Suko is internationally known um, for doing illustrated books, comics, prints, lots of protest work. Her arts is about uh, the exploitation of animals and humanity. Um, always a very dystopian view of the world. Uh, she is an ardent communist, as is her sister who, with whom she works, and um, unapologetically so. But it, it's her work is also sort of reminiscent of other ardent communists uh, that worked in uh, Mexico, like in the, in the 1940s and 50s, muralists like Diego Rivera and, and, and others like, uh, I can't name off the top of my head, but you know, the the Mexican muralists would have shared the same kinds of sensibilities. Orozco, that was the other name I was thinking of. Andy Poskovich um, is uh, a Bosnian artist. Uh, that's, that's his history, that's his upbringing. Um, he is a professor at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and I love his pieces. Andy works in woodcuts, additive woodcuts, and uh, this is about uh, one fifth the size of what he would normally work at. He normally works on very empirical, large um, woodcut prints. Uh, they tend to be environmental and they are really sophisticated and beautiful pieces. Uh, the former Slavic countries of uh, Yugoslavia uh, have a long and rich printmaking tradition. And, um, and he certainly comes from that. Wonderful guy, really wonderful guy. Um, this is another one of mine. Uh, this is a woodcut, it's called Mekong Patrol. And um, it's part of a graphic novel project I'm, called, I'm working on called Wolves in the City, which is about a, um, an American expat that joins the French Foreign Legion. Uh, during the time of the French-Algerian War. And so most of the work that I do has something to do with that um, as, as my sort of breeder idea. Most artists have two or three concepts that they work on throughout their career in one way, shape, or form, and those are usually called breeder ideas, meaning that one idea has legs and it can stand the test of time, and you can investigate that over and over over the course of years, um, and, and that's something that's working for me. And so in this project, um, I work on a variety of things from printmaking media to direct drawing on, on glass and paper, mixed media art as well. I just love 
printmaking. And I love the immediacy of carving into wood. Um, I'm an old analog guy. I can't figure out Procreate for the life of me. Uh, I like the immediacy of drawing with a pencil and paper or drawing something on a piece of wood and carving it out. Uh, there's, there's something um, intuitive about it. I like the resistance. I also draw on grained glass where um, I will take a piece of plate, uh, plate glass and I will use um, a, uh, a grinder and carborundum grit and I will grind with a levigator that glass until it has a tooth. It goes from clear to opaque and has a, a little bit of a tooth on it and I can draw on it. And I can make prints from that as well because the glass uh, is transparent. And so you can expose a photosensitized uh, plate to that surface. You have to create a dot pattern first, but you can expose a plate to that surface. And, and so it can be a drawing. It has the resistance of a litho stone, which I really like. And, um, and then has these other variables. But it's still my favorite because it's old and historic is just the woodcut. And another woodcut by Art Hofshi, who's um, a printmaker who works primarily out of Jerusalem. And her work is principally about the human condition. And again, her work tends to be very epic and monumental in scale for the most part. Five feet by eight feet, six feet by 12 feet woodcuts where multiple, multiple planks of wood are carved and laid down and an impression is, is created. Very rich, sophisticated pieces. Obviously, this is one of great intimacy for her. This piece is Karen Kuntz. Karen Kuntz was a longtime professor of printmaking at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And, um, and I love her work. Her work references uh, sort of cellular, cellular forms, cellular structures, um, sort of the interrelationship between them. They're very richly carved and very colorful. So multiple additive plates. Uh, and she was just an expert at that. Um, so that's the collection from the Southern Graphics Council. And then I'll want to conclude with one large piece that's a recent acquisition. So this is a recent acquisition. Uh, we got it, oh, what, about a year ago. Um, this is an artist named Willie Birch, uh, an African-American artist uh, uh, whose work is almost always about uh, the human condition and, and um, the place in the its place in the world. Uh, the title is, of this is The Aftermath of Katrina, a Church and a Home. And so the aftermath of the hurricane. And this is a, a screen print um, on handmade Japanese paper. So the paper is very delicate. Japanese paper seems so delicate in that it can just tear, but it's really, it's very unusual because it is actually incredibly strong paper. It has, it, while it seems very tender and fragile, it's got very strong fiber to it. Um, it's extremely absorbent. So Japanese paper, which my last woodcut is on, is so absorbent um, that, that the ink can also bleed through to the back, but you're ensured that the quality of the ink to the to the paper is going to be secure and, and really resonate. So he's using a Japanese paper here. I don't think there's any particular conceptual reason for that. Um, but let's look at this just in terms of shape and form. It has its history in, in, in sort of contemporary realism, but slightly abstracted. So this crushed house is not fractured in, in the angularity that you would expect. It has a movement and a flow, a life to it, an energy that to me suggests that the church is not about a place. It's about a, um, a state of mind and about the community that the church embraces. And so uh, while it's damaged, and destroyed in one way. It's not destroyed at all. The church is about us and our relationship 
with God, and it will be rebuilt. And it can be built again whole without any infrastructure. It can be built again whole just by our community with each other. Um, but I think that the forms here, very flowing, going to something extremely rigid, something very flowing, something extremely rigid, provides you uh, distinct contrasts and, uh, and, and suggests uh, the fragility of the human condition, but uh, also the um, vitality of the human spirit. And um, I love his work. I always thought he was a young artist. Um, when, I, when I see his work, I always think of him as being very young, but he's not, he's, uh, he's 81. And, uh, and yet it has a, a connotation. If any of you is a painter and you're looking at the new German expressionist art, um, there's an artist named Neo Roque who is really, really fabulous. And um, his work is based on the mythology of um, East Germany, of, of what would be East Germany, and has a very energetic and, and vital kind of relationship. And he draws from popular mythology uh, from Germany, uh, the German realism of World War II, and then uh, a very contemporary, playful kind of relationship. And if you look at his work and compare it to Willie's work, I would say that Willie Birch has been informed by him. I don't know if he's ever looked at at um, New York's work, but there seems to be a shared and communal language going on, which I find very interesting.